Okay, so uh, first of all, uh, Barry, President Corey was in our chapel about a month ago. And man, he brought the house down. I mean, seriously, we had planned this uh, a few years ago. We did the same thing where we did a chapel at APU and a chapel at Biola. And I was thinking, you know, it's Barry. How good is this going to be? He was amazing, actually. And students were lined up when he was done and couldn't get enough of him. And uh, yeah, so man, I, I'm just going to let go of that, really. I'm not going to try to measure up to Barry Corey. He's probably the finest orator of any Christian university president I know. And, and he is a good friend, by the way. I, uh, I was at LAX once, Los Angeles International Airport, getting ready to catch a flight. And somebody came up behind me and threw their arms around me and kissed me on the back of the neck. I knew it wasn't Gail because she was standing in front of me. And plus, she's pretty short. Um, and turn around, here's Barry, right? He's, uh, he's unashamedly affectionate. <laughs> Actually, he's unashamedly my friend. And I hope someday you will experience that as I have with him. So uh, we're going to talk about Mary, the mother of Jesus. And I get it. Look, we're near the end of the semester. Uh, you guys have a lot of uh, deadlines coming up, and things are pretty busy. Plus, you managed to get out of bed this morning and make it to chapel. Uh, about a month ago, I went to Africa. We have two campuses in South Africa that our students go to for a semester at a time, one in Cape Town, one in Peter Meritzburg. I was getting ready to leave the house, and Gail said, okay, I'll see you in 10 days with your cold from Africa. See, in uh, Africa, uh, the students have these service sites that they are at a couple days a week, and they are just filled with, in the Peter Marisburg area, Zulu children, and in the Cape Town area, Kosa ch children. And these kids kind of are magnets for all these germs. I married a nursing major. She said, hey, I'll see you in 10 days with your African cold. I said, honey, I, it's not, I'm not going to get a cold. She said, you always get a cold. I have my African cold this morning. Uh, so thanks for bearing with me. So here we are in the Advent season, and I want to talk about Mary, the mother of Jesus, because her story is our story. And her steps of obedience are our steps of obedience. And her willingness to allow God to, to put into her lap the hinge of history that we are all now ambassadors for and champions for is pretty remarkable. So uh, let me read this passage of scripture to you. Um, this is Luke uh, chapter 1, 26 to 38. Just bear with me. It's a little longer, this, uh, but this is an important passage. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, don't be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God, and now you will conceive in your room and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus, and he will be great, and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, how, how can this be since I'm a virgin? And the angel said to her, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born to you will be holy. He will be called the Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her who was said to be barren for nothing will be impossible with God. And then Mary said, here I am the servant of the Lord, let it be with me according to your word. And the angels departed from her. Uh, let me just pray real quick. Father, thank you for your word living in us, available to us, working through us. Uh, help me to step out of the way this morning and let your Holy Spirit and the power of your word speak to us in this Advent season. In Jesus' name, amen. So this passage occurs in Luke right after the narrative 
uh, this really remarkable narrative of uh, Zechariah and Elizabeth. And, and these are the parents of John the Baptist, and, and we understand from this narrative that they were, are related to Mary, therefore Jesus and John the Baptist are also related. For me, this is one of the most inspiring passages in all of the Gospels. An engaged teenage girl is visited by an angel and invited to play a key role in the most important moment thus far in human history. So in this passage, um, Mary is engaged to Joseph, and probably in the Jewish tradition, this would have happened maybe as long as a year earlier. It is so sacred and so solemn that, uh, that it, this engagement could only be broken by a decree of divorce. I'm often uh, involved in the lives of students who get to know what's going on actually Peggy Campbell, our board chair and Biola alum, she and I teach a senior seminar in ethics in the School of Business on Tuesday nights. So we get to know students pretty well. And uh, it's really fun to watch the engagement moment. You've kind of seen them on Facebook or you've, you know, and uh, they'll be walking on the beach and then all of a sudden there's this like this table with something on it in the middle of the beach. What a surprise. And so they sit down and they open this and their friends all pop up and the guy at the camera takes pictures and the moment is captured, right? It's this powerful moment. Similar but even more significant was Mary's engagement. And, and this passage uh, presents her as a, as a uh, young Jewish woman who has absolutely lived her life in obedience and is exercising a plan that she has. I know that you have finals coming up at the end of the semester. I know that all of you are sitting here with some kind of formulated plan in your mind. It's why you're at Biola University. It's, it's a part of why you go to college because you got this idea that God has put in place for you a... Uh, a remarkable plan, and in verse 28, Mary's plan is interrupted. And this verse says, the angel comes to Mary and says, greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. Or as the NIV says, greetings, you who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. See, I, I love that... Um, that this picture of Mary is as it is. She is living her life in full obedience to the one true God. So much so that when the angel comes to her, he identifies her and says, hey, I want you to know that God's favor rests with you. He sees in you this, this, this amazing person. And as we'll unpack, he's got this amazing additional plan for your life. I wanna say to you this morning, Biola students, that God says the same thing to you. He says the same thing to me. Greetings, John. You're highly favored. And you'll see that, that with that favor comes this opportunity to live out our own hinge in history, our own opportunity to carry the Christ into the world Mary has a really good life plan in front of her, engaged to Joseph and headed to life together, start a family and serve the one and true God. Uh, this is a picture of a backpacking trip. So for almost the last 40 years, I've gone on 38 of these. Our student leaders go into the wilderness of the Ansel Adams uh, in August, about 140 of us, so 10 groups of about 14. This is my group this year. And... Uh, let me tell you what I love about this. We, we sit around the campfires at night and we tell stories, our own story, and others listen to us. Except for the two days right in the middle, there's a two day and two night where every student is on their own solo, a time when they're uh, alone, if you will, with their journal and some other things. Uh, but what I love about this picture, I got to hear, so these are mostly juniors and seniors, they're, they're in the residence halls, and I got to hear how they were planning to live their life. I got to hear from them the kinds of stuff that I know is also going on in your life. And I think the, the really good plans that exist in the lives of college students today at Azusa and Biola
I wonder if, um, if we would be open to having God interrupt that plan. I wonder if we would be open to what might be surpriseful for us. I wonder if there would be an opportunity for our plan to take on the added dimension of, a, of something that God wants from us and, and without our obedience to that opportunity, uh, we will not accomplish that thing for which God has created us. In verse 34, there's this verse. Um, the angel has come to her and explained uh, what will happen, and she says, how can this be uh, since I am a virgin? Uh, she will carry the Messiah into the world. Her pregnancy is the answered dream of every Jewish woman. So at that point, if you're a young Jewish woman and you're headed to marriage, you carry this dream that someday the Messiah is going to come and maybe he'll come through me. Maybe I'll be the one to birth the Messiah. So when the angel comes and he says, look, you're it. Your son will be called Jesus, and he will inherit the throne of David, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And he explains, this is the Messiah coming, and it will come, he will come as a birth to you. Jewish people had no idea that God's plan involved an immaculate conception. And so the angel says to her, you're going to give birth to this Messiah, and she says, wait a minute, wait, wait, wait. That plan doesn't make a lot of sense to me. How can that be? And the mystery and the wonder of being obedient to Jesus Christ uh, comes forward. Oh, that picture's not up yet. So look at this picture. Um, this is a picture uh, of the Annunciation by Henry Tanner. Henry Tanner was a remarkable artist. And uh, around the turn of the 19th century, he, is, uh, he comes from the African-American community, from the uh, uh, African Episcopal Church, and he does paintings that are just phenomenal. The banjo player is probably his most famous, but many of these are absolutely focused. He's the son of a minister, and they're focused on spiritual moments. So look at this picture by Tanner. And he's trying to capture that moment when Gabriel is standing in front of Mary, and, and he is announcing to her God's plan. You know, I gotta tell you, there are some days when I wish an angel would visit me and clarify exactly what it is I'm supposed to be doing for God. I mean, I don't get me wrong, I, I know that I'm supposed to be obedient, love my neighbor, love God. I'm, I'm supposed to walk in ways that the world will see Christ in me. But I have to tell you, there are some days when my plan feels really complex, and I wonder what the outcome is really going to be. And I wish that Tanner's picture would work for me. I wish, I wish Gable would show up. Uh, I'd probably have to say, hold on, Gail, you know, this is gonna be okay, We'd, uh, but here's an angel in our bedroom, and he says, John, this is exactly what I want you to do. Uh, last night, in our class that Peggy and I teach, I ask students, how do you know when your plan has been added to by God? How do you know when the plan you have in place has, has been modified or corrected? How do you know that your plan is the right plan? Because none of us in that room last night in that ethics class have had an angel visit us. It's really pretty revealing. I, I have to say, I. I have great confidence in the seniors graduating from places like Biola and Azusa given their spiritual maturity and their growth. But they said, they said things like, you know, I know that God has added something to my plan when it feels a little uncomfortable, when it feels a little risky, when it feels like I'm asked to do more than I think I can do. You know, God doesn't ask Mary to change her identity. He wants her. He, he wants her to remain who she is, obedient to the Yahweh God, to live out her life in grace and truth and mercy. Doesn't ask her to change her identity. He asks her to change her plan. Biola, that's what God wants from us today. He wants to be sure that as we grow in our identity in Christ, 
that whatever that is that we're holding in our hand at that moment, that that doesn't change the motives that we have. It doesn't change the selflessness that is growing up in us because of the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. So, uh, the angel uh, visits Mary and says, here's God's addition to your plan. It's gonna require that you change your plan. He says, you're going to carry the Messiah into the world. The child that you will give birth, give life to, will in return give life to you. And do you know that that is exactly what he's asking of us, that we will carry the Messiah into the world? So when, when I think about God's call on my life, I think of my responsibility to live out who I am in Christ in an ever-increasingly complex world. You know, a couple weeks ago, our country had a surprise election. We live, as you do, in a college community with uh, lots of diverse feelings and opinions about how the government or the elected officials represent me or represent my wants or do I feel safe or unsafe. We live in a world where mostly people use megaphones to talk to each other and there's very little ability to listen to each other. We live in a world where, where the opportunity to simply receive words from another person and return grace to that person has almost become a lost art. Biola, God has planted you in La Mirada, in, in, in the greater Los Angeles area, one of the most cosmopolitan cities in the world with more than 100 languages, more than 120 different cultures. Why has God done this? Why has he put the power of who you are in this geographic and demographic location? Why is that? Could it be, could it be that the Jesus you carry into the world, like the Jesus Mary birthed into the world, is intended to transform culture and society through you as it did through her? So uh, I love Mary's response. In verse 38, she simply says, here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. So she didn't like get on Snapchat or Instagram. She didn't do hashtag MOM, mother of Messiah. She didn't like get, stand on the corner and say, it's me, I'm the one. Actually this Greek word here used for servant is the same word used as we understand the opportunity that was given to servants in households where they willingly gave up their rights to become a lifetime servant of the master. And to demonstrate that devotion, they would place their ear against the doorframe of the house and an owl would pierce their ear and they would forever have that mark, so that the world would know that that person is a servant to their master willingly. It was, they, weren't, they weren't purchased. They weren't forced into slavery. They weren't captured. They gave up their freedom to be in service to the master. And so when Mary says, here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. She's saying, I, I relinquish my rights. I bond myself to you. I live to accomplish the work given to me by my master and Lord. Yeah, I, man, I want that to be me. There are days, I gotta say, when I wanna go back to the doorpost and, and take back my commitment. Seems a little bit too much or a little too frustrating or a little too scary or, but I can't, I can't, man, I've been marked. And so I re-up and I recommit myself to that place of service. And so we've got Mary who, who, who will leave this 
chapter one and go into chapter two where she makes the long trip to Bethlehem. And she, she is in the, the house, the crowded house of her relatives and she and Joseph with the animals delivered the Messiah into a manger. And this verse in uh, chapter two, uh, Luke 2, 19, but Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. You know, I didn't get the angel who appeared to me and told me what God's plan was, but I do have things similar to Mary. I do have those moments that I know God showed up in my life. I mean, imagine, imagine Mary who gives birth to a baby, and right after that, shepherds show up, and they do this story about the angels in the heavens and the, what they're declaring, and they say, and by the way, there's this huge star outside, and it's pointing right at your house. So Mary, Mary has that memory, and so do we. But let me tell you about that. In culture, in society, in the stuff of everyday life, those memories tend to weaken, and they tend to fade, and we tend to lose sight of what God had done in our life. We, we forget the week at Forest Home, or we forget that time with our youth pastor where we committed ourselves, or we forget that moment when God showed up in our family, in our life, they become distant memories, but not for Mary. She ponders those things. It's that she places them deep in her heart. Viola students, if I could line all of you up this morning, and if there was some spiritual or physical way that I could press into your heart the sharp edges of memory that would not wear away, like a like a thorn that would disturb you so that you could recall when Christ was faithful so you could remember those moments as Mary did and that you could recommit to carrying Christ into the world as she did so that you would be a part of those hinge moments in history. If I could, if I could place that into your heart so that, so that you could push back against the human condition that tends to leave us forgetful of God's faithfulness. You know, uh, church history suggests that Mary traveled with the disciple John. You remember Christ says to Mary and John on the cross, mother behold your son, son behold your mother, and, and church history tells us that Mary remained with John until she would die. Some believe that means that she followed John to Ephesus where he was part of a church plant. We know of that church because Paul would later write the book to the church at Ephesians, at Ephesus. So in Ephesians 2.10, Paul writes these words to those who know Mary's story, they may have even, it's possible that her grave is even out in front of the church, but they certainly know her story as part of the first generation of the early church. Paul says to the church at Ephesus in Ephesians 2.10, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us. The whole point of Advent is that we are waiting for the next coming of Christ and we celebrate this coming. The whole point of Mary's story is that she was obedient and allowed God to move her plan aside so his could be a part of it. The whole point of this morning is that each of us would recognize that we have been prepared by God for his work and his plan. Yeah. Hey, uh, I will be thinking of you and praying for you as you rush towards finals. I will ask 
if I can, as a person who loves college students and loves the work of God on Christian college campuses, that you be open for the surprises that will come with the end of this semester or with the wrap-up of your um, fall studies. Uh, let me pray for you. Father, thanks for the gift of today. Um, for these remarkable students uh, who are committed uh, to carrying Christ into the world in obedience and grace and truth. Help all of us to respond as Mary did as a servant. And give all of us the power to remember that you are ever with us. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Shalom. Go with God. Biola University prepares Christians to think biblically about everything, from science to business to education and the arts. Learn more at biola.edu.